Hello, I'm Rebecca the Maths Lady and one of the aspects of maths teaching I'm most passionate about is this discussion about traditional and non-traditional methods of maths teaching and my particular passion is about helping people choose what's right for them and helping them to combine both of them in ways that really work for them and their students. So the purpose of this video is to help you really clearly understand both sides of maths teaching so that you can make wise decisions. My background is that I've taught using traditional and non-traditional methods in quite a few different high schools. I've been working for the last eight years in primary or elementary schools to capture best practice and learn to share it. I've lectured in maths education in two top universities and I've been writing on this topic for a long time. This is an article from 2008 where you can see I'm absolutely on the same theme and I've also worked over the years on how technology is impacting on this debate. So the first thing to notice when you're talking about this topic is the lack of agreed definitions. What is traditional teaching? What is non-traditional teaching? Why do people call it non-traditional teaching rather than actually giving it a name? Well, there are two reasons why these definitions are so unclear. One is that people have different perspectives on them. And the other is that when people do try to define them, their definitions often get hijacked. For example, for quite a long time, the opposite of traditional teaching was called progressive teaching. And progressive teaching was all about teaching in ways that allow all children to progress, no matter what their backgrounds are when they come into your classroom. But then suddenly that term progressive teaching was hijacked and interpreted as being teachers letting children just run riot and do whatever they wanted, which of course it wasn't. But that's the um, context that people now associate with that word. So it's made defining these topics difficult. But I'm going to be really clear about my definitions today. And you can disagree with them if you like, but hopefully they're a reasonable starting point for a conversation. So for me, traditional teaching is about following a pre-written scheme of work that tries to capture the key things that children should know and is accompanied by resources for teaching those things. And non-traditional teaching is about teachers looking at the kids in front of them, looking at their own skill sets and making decisions in real time about how to teach maths. So traditional teaching generally involves following a pre-written scheme of teaching which works in small steps and is created by people outside the classroom other than the teacher. Whereas non-traditional teaching is about teachers innovating in response to what they see in front of them and what's in their room and making their own decisions about the best way to teach maths. And that tends to involve a greater focus on low floor, high ceiling ways of teaching maths and on developing children's skills of being mathematicians, helping them to wrestle with complex situations and develop their ability to talk about complex situations in mathematical ways, to listen to other students and to work collaboratively to solve problems. Now, of course, as soon as you define the terms in this way, you start to think, well, surely we can combine these things. And I'm going to talk about that more in just a moment, but I want to delve a little bit deeper into the positives and negatives of each style of teaching before I do that. So there are many benefits to traditional teaching. Clearly, it makes obvious sense to understand the purpose of maths teaching as being to transfer knowledge about mathematics from the past into the future, into our new generation of students. It's just obvious that we would want to do that. Another benefit of a traditional approach is that parents and tutors know where children are and understand what they're doing and can really help. And there are many circumstances in which those people want to be empowered to help their children. The third great benefit is that if you're in a chaotic teaching situation in a school where there's huge staff turnover and you're struggling to get skilled staff, Clearly the benefits of introducing a really intelligent pre-written scheme are enormous because it's so much easier for a member of staff to come in, pick it up, teach it, and for the whole community to know exactly where everyone is. And also if you're going to move to forensic teaching, teaching in ways that respond to the environment in front of you, you need teachers who are there for quite some time. Traditional teaching is relatively lowly skilled because the scheme of work is supplying a lot of what the teacher needs. 
it's easy to set and monitor targets for children and staff and that can be really useful in education. A lot of people are very afraid of failure but for some children it's a useful experience. It makes them wake up and focus and work harder and overcome barriers and obstacles to their learning. It's easy to digitalize traditional schemes and put them online. And there's another benefit to traditional teaching in that it diffuses blame away from the teacher and that's a particularly important feature of it in England where we have an extreme curriculum and lots of failure. If teachers are using respected external schemes of work then the focus for blame is on that scheme of work rather than on the teacher. So there are many benefits to traditional style teaching. But there are also many ways in which teaching can be better than that. And there's a key technical point that people watching this video need to make sure they understand. And that is that there is rarely one way of doing maths. And if you're teaching one way of doing maths, you may be losing your children because they're thinking of another way. And pre-written schemes are really bad at dealing with that compared with a teacher who's really listening to all the children hearing their voices and making connections between them. Now you may think this is a small issue, but it isn't. It starts right at the beginning of maths. If you look at a topic like odd and even numbers, when my son was five, I was chatting to him and his friend about them. And it was clear that he'd done lots of activities with his teacher where even numbers were numbers that could be shared into two equal groups. Great work. But his friend had done lots of activities where even numbers were groups that could be shared into exact numbers of pairs. And they couldn't follow what each other was saying at all or understand it. Now, if you're a teacher who works in these environments, you start to make the links and think about maybe teaching with resources like these. Is that an odd or an even number of squares? Well, it's an even number because it does share exactly into two equal groups and it's an exact number of pairs. You can see the pairs here. And then of course this is an odd number because it doesn't do either. And if you've got resources like these, you're making the connections for all children and all children are coming to understand both ideas and it's much easier to talk about adding and subtracting odd and even numbers. What's gonna happen? They can visualize it and it's great if the children who've talked about even numbers being two equal groups talk about it in this way as well because then it's so easy to understand that as a queue of children or children walking somewhere. Even is when everyone has a partner. Odd is when somebody has to walk with the teacher. And when we're lecturing in maths education and training teachers, one of the first things we do is put them in situations where they suddenly realise that what they thought was the only way of doing maths isn't at all. And other people are thinking completely differently and teach them to understand that that is going to be going on in their classrooms. As a mathematician, you only need one way as someone using math. As a math teacher, you need to understand it all. And the most powerful thing is if you have those discussions going on in your classroom where you're listening to children, they teach you this all the time and you get upskilled very, very quickly and to a very high level compared with a situation where you're only working with a pre-written scheme of work. Now, sometimes that pre-written scheme of work upskills you a lot in the first instance, but there's only so far it can take you. There's this whole world beyond that that you only see and become professionally skilled in if you've got this kind of talkative environment going on. Another benefit of forensic teaching is that it's often far more efficient and powerful time-wise because you can contract topics that children can clearly do. You don't have to wade through materials they don't need and you instinctively delve into and find different ways of teaching topics that they're finding difficult. Another key issue that's addressed by non-traditional teaching is the fact that traditional methods assume that all the children coming in to the classroom have the same background in mathematics. And of course they don't. They all have different gaps and are in different places. It's not a single chain that they're moving along. There are all sorts of skills. So you tend to end up needing really detailed setting or tracking, which isn't needed in non-traditional approaches because you can use low floor, high ceiling tasks. 
they are maths tasks that pivot around contexts that engage every child or structures that every child can understand even if they've got huge gaps in their maths and they heal those gaps very quickly and also set up for children to go to very high levels that's why it's called low floor high ceiling teaching and what you then see as a teacher is instead of children making small steps gradually in their maths you see children making huge leaps from really low levels to really high levels as things just come into focus and click. Another benefit of non-traditional approaches is that children learn to wrestle with complicated problems, real life problems, big chunks of data, and it becomes normal just to be struggling. And they learn to articulate their thinking in these situations and be adventurous and creative and make connections between different maths topics and the real world. And all these things are good things. Two more things to cover. One is that as a teacher, it is just amazing to be present in the classroom with your children in all your thinking and responding to what's going on. The most iconic bit of video footage of the 20th century was Jacob Bronowski in the ash pits at Auschwitz, making a plea to close the gap between the decisions and the actions. And there's so much of that that's real and relevant in this debate. It is the most wonderful, wonderful experience to be a teacher who's teaching forensically and is seeing children making these enormous leaps and really flourishing as complete human beings. And yet, just to link it back, some teachers and some students love maths being an abstract thing where you're just right or wrong. They love the security of that and we need to acknowledge that too. And we need to acknowledge some of the problems with non-traditional approaches. It's much harder to track. It's much harder for the wider community to understand what's going on and help. Although it is possible for the wider community to have input because there's more flexibility. And if people come with great ideas for engaging with schools, it's much more likely to happen. However, there's one transparently obvious criticism of non-traditional approaches, which is that children make less progress with traditional skills, which I've found doesn't stand up in reality. Children become more enthusiastic and engaged in their maths. They see themselves as mathematicians and they become more motivated to engage with traditional skills, curriculums as and when they're needed. If non-traditional teaching is done well. One thing I am not suggesting is that you take a school which has always used traditional approaches and just decide to change everything. That just doesn't make any sense. You have to be skilled and supported to use these approaches. And of course, generally the best thing is to integrate them. If you've got a traditional approach, you could make a step change by making sure there is time for problem solving, wider problem solving, that uses some of the non-traditional style teaching. If you have a non-traditional forensic approach, you probably also want to use a traditional style curriculum. You may use an online curriculum, and of course, some of those curriculums have been improved and inspired by the insights from non-traditional teachers. So some of their knowledge is being shared through those schemes. When I was a leader of mathematics education in a high school with many challenges, I used a three-way approach. I did a lot of contextual teaching, which was low floor, high ceiling teaching. I used online traditional style teaching that children could work with at their own rate. And sometimes I just taught topics in a traditional way when it felt like the right thing to do. But there you begin to complete the loop on my definition because I defined non-traditional teaching as being forensic teaching where teachers are making judgments about what's right. And of course, if teachers are doing that, they're very likely to use elements of traditional approaches because they're good and they're well researched and they've got great resources with them. One last little point I want to make before I complete this video is about tracking or setting, as we call it in the UK. A lot of the non-traditional approaches were discovered and developed in schools that abolished setting. It's not necessary to abolish setting to do this now. The best way to share good non-traditional practice is to create videos, case studies, detailed, inspirational examples 
of how schools are doing things in ways that they think are better, which schools that are watching them can analyse and say, well, is this going to work for us? Do we want to do it? If so, why? What are the challenges going to be? And how should we do it differently if we're going to do it? Tracking or detracking is not the heart of this. If you do non-traditional approaches really well, tracking becomes less essential. And that's really nice. It gives you the option to make decisions about the extent to which tracking is right for your school. I hope this video has been of some use to this debate. I would like to leave you now just with one plea, which is be kind to people who are in different positions to you in this debate and call out people who aren't. I've been free sharing the professional development that I've been running for years on my YouTube channel, which is Rebecca the Maths Lady. If you'd like to see it there, you can find a full list of videos on my authenticmaths.co.uk website. There's a list of videos, a list of free to download worksheets. There are no barriers to anything. I'm not in this for profit. This is just a passion and a hobby. I have a Facebook group, which is Expert Primary Maths Teaching, and a LinkedIn group, which is Math, Math Education, Math Culture. If you'd like to find me in either forum, it'd be lovely to chat to you. If you've something to say, please tell me. I want to know. Thanks. Bye for now.